now like to introduce Connie Jorsvik. Connie Jorsvik was an RN for 25 years and was always a patient advocate, first and foremost. She found patient pathways and has been acting as an independent healthcare navigator for almost eight years. She knows that patient and care partner empowerment are the keys to getting the care you need and deserve. This webinar is the second part of the education series. Uh, last week she talked on navigating the healthcare system. And during this webinar, um, you'll learn more about our healthcare system, but also how you can do advanced care planning. Well, welcome, Connie. Thank you for being here again today. Oh, you're and so I will welcome. Pass it over to you now. Marvelous. I see a few names that I saw last week, so welcome everybody. And um, if possible, um, go back over these presentations at your leisure um, from the links of the website. There's a lot of information and I move really quickly. Um, and I just wanted to um, say that I, I moved fairly quickly through this, but we should have time for questions and answers at the end. I've done this so often that um, I probably will be answering your questions as we move forward, but it's also pretty basic information and we can go in much deeper in the, qu in the questions. So um, this is advanced care planning for family caregivers and those they are, uh, and those they are caring for. Uh, I believe in empowering patients and those who love them. Um, it makes sense that you would want to be empowered. You would want to know more about the healthcare system. But often we come from generations where doctors are, um, are the last word and we trust them. And, um, but quite frankly, not everybody knows everything. And it's really important that you know how to ask and who to ask and um, how to educate yourself moving forward. So that is the whole premise be be behind absolutely everything that I do. I've written a book on advanced care planning. Um, I'll give you the links to how to order it at the end. The first half is on navigating the healthcare system and being empowered, what that means, how to get the care that you need. And the second half is on specifics around advanced care planning. There are detailed indexes and resources in the book. Read what you can, what you need, and when you need them. It's kind of a book that's just too much to read all at once. And then put the book in your case of emergency folder, which I'll be going over, and use it as your guide when you or your loved ones are in the healthcare system. It really is a guide for when you are in the healthcare system, and I don't want you to lose it on your bedside table or something. Um, when you have suddenly found yourself landing in emergency or be, are in acute care with a person that you love. So serious and complex illness and injury and life ending diagnosis can do can and do happen to anyone of any age. What over the age of 60, it's usually complex chronic conditions that um, eventually take our lives. But when we're under 60, especially under 50 years old, it is more likely that it is going to be a life-threatening cancer or, or a car accidents, um, things that will take your life very suddenly or, or land you in the hospital very suddenly uh, and very acutely for periods of time. Advanced care planning is important for all adults, no matter the age or your state of health. It is my goal um, to gradually shift the conversation so that it is just as um, much a part of adult planning as estate planning is. Um, it should start early. The conversations need to start when people are young so that they're not, um, they're not, that people aren't burdened by the conversations that you'll have later on. And the COVID-19 pandemic heightens the need and the urgency with which we should all be completing our advanced care planning. It always seems too early until it's too late. And caregivers often neglect their own advanced care planning 
So are you looking after you? Often caregivers are the first ones are go down sooner than the person that they are caring for. We often neglect our own health. We don't see the warning signs of things that are taking place or we just put things off. And as a nurse, a cardiac nurse, I saw this happen all the time where um, the caregiver um, often was more acutely ill than the person that they were looking after. So I would quite often have couples who were on the ward at the same time, one with angina and the other with a heart attack. Um, and if you are looking after somebody, um, you need to realize, think about what that person, what you will do with the other person that you're caring for if your health takes a tumble first, whether it's short term or long term. Advanced care planning is an umbrella term for conversations and documentation about your values, beliefs, and preferences for future care for a time when you can't make your own health care decisions. It is a vital talk, topic for family caregivers who are reluctant to bring up these conversations with those who we, we are caring for. When those we are caring for are seriously ill, when they're going down a dementia, their dementia journey, when they've got a chronic complex condition, we are really reluctant to bring, bring up these really important topics. And I'm going to give you some ideas on things that you can say. And you don't think it's important to do the planning for, your, for yourself. Um, and it probably is the most important person to take care of first is you. This is like an oxygen um, mask coming out of the airplane. You put it on yourself first so that you can look after the people that you love. Advanced care planning is not one document. It is a series of documents and conversations. It's about thinking about what's important to you. It's about your values and beliefs first and foremost. And I'll be going into what that means. Um, ongoing discussions with your loved ones, health documentation, there is financial preparation that needs to take place, and estate planning is um, also a piece of advanced care planning. Though estate planning, um, the planning is now, the execution of your estate planning is after you have um, died. Advanced care planning documentation is done in preparation for a time when you are no longer capable of making your health care decisions. So people, are concerned about making advanced care plans, thinking that somebody else can take over for them. You, and the capability piece is very, very fuzzy and very, very gray. Um, and after years of doing this kind of work that I have discovered that nobody wants to deem anybody else incapable. And so it, that can actually be very difficult for families. When do they step into this mix? And when do they start making plans for the other person? And during COVID-19, the no longer capable uh, portion of that is extremely relevant. It's important in these uncertain times because with COVID-19, the progression of illness can be sudden. And even prior to ventilation, the person may be so ill that they can't make decisions and will really need to rely on others. If you are on a ventilator, you will likely be deeply sedated and others will need to make decisions for you. So even when times go back to normal, for yourself and those you care for, the process is consider the values and beliefs of your loved one as well as yourself. 70% of spouses do not fully understand the values, beliefs, and preferences for care of their of significant other. We make assumptions about what the other person want, and most of the time that was what we would want for them. Determine where you are in your healthcare journey, which is a vital assessment with COVID-19, and we're going to go over that. Choose your, your substitute decision makers thoughtfully and consider with consideration. Talk to your substitute decision makers and loved ones about your values and beliefs and document your wishes. So strategies in, in assisting in completing your advanced care planning. Prioritize what needs to be done first. 
If something unexpected happened tomorrow, like COVID-19, what would you want to have done? So this is the this is kind of um, the analogy I use is the forest fire analogy. If you were told um, that a forest fire was coming at you and you need to be on fire um, on evacuation alert, what is it that you would want to take with you? What do you need to get done? Um, and so I want you to think about that as if you COVID was a forest fire. What do you need to get done? immediately for so for some people they have their paperwork in order they've done their advanced care planning as far as writing their representation agreement they've done their estate planning but they haven't had those vital conversations with their loved ones for other people like me i've had the vital conversations um, with my loved ones but i haven't um my paperwork might not always be in order so at the beginning of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, I made sure to get my taxes done and I reviewed all of my files so that my family could actually find um, what they were, what they would need if I was to end up in hospital. What are the biggest risks to you um, and the person you're caring for? Sorry for the typo in that. Do that part of your advanced care planning first. Set up a buddy system. Put it into bite-sized pieces and reward yourself at the end. So if you've got a lot to do, maybe you even want to reward yourself with a couple of days away, a bit of a respite, um, or just doing a dance at the end of it and high-fiving your friends virtually that you've got your advanced care planning done. I just wanted to make a note about changing or canceling advanced care planning documents. When a person is capable, any advanced care pl planning documents can be changed or canceled. Revoked is the legal word at any time. So that can be when the person's in hospital, they decide that um, the person they picked as their representative, they don't want that person anymore. Um, or they have decided that um, they really do want to be resuscitated, even though in the past that they said that they didn't. It's up to um, you can change this at the last moment. Um, you can, if you don't, haven't put your papers with anybody, such as a lawyer or on nidus.ca, which I will tell you about in a little bit, then you can just simply write through them revoked and they're done and you can write a new one. That's an extremely important for an advanced directive and I'll go over that in a little bit. So the first step, the most important step is thinking about your values and beliefs and preferences for future health care. Have these vital discussions now prior to the possibility of serious illness. Decision makers need to know the wishes of those they care for in order to assertively speak for them. So I'll give you an example of a few of the cases that I've been involved with. Um, so a patient has um, rapidly rapidly deteriorated and is now on a ventilator and the doctors are asking the family whether he would want to have wanted a tube feed um, put in for temporary nutrition and it's actually a really big decision to make that to make that decision you need a lot of information and the number of times that the patient hasn't had a discussion with their family ever in their lives about the kinds of things that they would want a lot of us will say we don't want heroics. What exactly does that mean? And I'm going to go over some of those things now. In this webinar, our, our focus on values and beliefs is a short exercise focused on a time of crisis. So for your values and beliefs, what makes life worth living? What can or cannot be sac sacrificed or compromised? What needs to be completed before your death? And consider any special faith-based rituals or, cult or cultural preferences that you might want at the end of your life. So I had a client a couple of years ago who was going in for surgery and he had a 50-50 chance, um, literally, of his life would be immediately better and he would walk out of the hospital the next day or he had a very high chance of 
um, not making it off the operating room table. So what he put into his very short little uh, wishes for future healthcare is three simple sentences. If I can't walk out of this hospital on my own, if I cannot be in my garden, if I cannot hold my grandchildren on my lap, then I do not want to live. So those are very um, distinct values and beliefs, so things that were really important to him. So we don't need to get into a huge amount of depth when we're writing an advanced directive. We just need to say what's important to us. And at, over the next, he did not do well. And over the next couple of days, I was with his family and they used those three sentences and took them very much to heart. And his, as his condition continued to deteriorate, they were able to pull back to those three and it was very obvious that he was never going to walk out of the hospital. And so they withdrew heroics and he died a short time later. And they, their grief was much less complex because he had given them that instruction before his death. What do you or your loved ones value? So could it be food? Do you want to have a celebration of uh, family and food? So for my mom, um, she always wanted to serve food and with friends and family. So even though she was uh, unable to eat her last few days of life, we had a barbecue and friends and family came and celebrated food with her at the hospice. Um, and that's pretty common to actually have a picnic or a family dinner. Unfortunately, in these COVID times, it's not happening. But um, we can still do things virtually about the things that we value how do you feel about quality of life versus quantity? Most of us would say that we want quality of life, whereas our families would say that they want quantity of life. They want one more day with us, one more week, one more month. Whereas if we are in a, a great amount of pain or discomfort or life is all the joy is out of life, then we would not want to continue. So it's really important that you have that conversation. And where would you or they want to spend the last hours or days of their lives? So think about whether you would want to die at home, in hospice, in residential care. And if, it, if you're actively dying on an acute care unit, what can be done to make your life a little bit more pleasant, having family around? And right now, a lot of, patient, a lot of families are taking their loved ones home from acute care even when it's pretty obvious that their loved ones are not going to make it and having them die at home so that the families can be with them. So it's an enormously massive thing that families are having to go through right now. And it's really important that you have that conversation. So wherever possible, would you want to be at home so your family could be with you? So after you've thought about all of those things, and in my book, there's a lot more information and there's a whole bunch of resources on how to have those conversations. The next step is determine where you are in your health journey. And the reason that this is important is a lot of people get mixed up between their values and beliefs and realistically understanding where they are in their health journey. Consider values and beliefs in a realistic context for age and health and your illnesses. Think about what's important in your life and in the future and in case of serious injury, illness and end of life. And we're going to go into that in depth when I get to advanced directives. And then step three is choosing your substitute decision maker. And this is just a very quick overview. A substitute decision maker is the accepted worldwide term for the person who will make healthcare decisions for you when you are not capable of making those decisions for yourself. So in most couples and most families, we assume that the substitute decision maker will be our spouse or be one of our adult children. It, wherever possible, even if you're not going to name this person in a representation agreement, which I highly um, ask that you do, um, and that at least you put it in a letter, I would like Sam, my husband, to make my decisions. Or 
introduce the person you want to make your decisions to your healthcare team, whether it's home care team, your family doctor, your specialists, whatever, say, I want my daughter Elizabeth to be my substitute decision maker. So you don't have to make a form, you don't have to fill out anything, but you should declare who you want to make decisions for you with your healthcare team. If your loved one is not able to make decisions on, on your, I was trying to make this, this uh, presentation, so it was for caregivers and I've mucked up some of my words. So if your loved one is not able to make decisions on their own and have not assigned a substitute decision maker, a temporary substitute decision maker will be authorized to make decisions for them. So um, quite often, if somebody has not designated somebody, they haven't said that they want their husband or their wife or their adult children as their substitute decision maker and they end up in hospital by themselves, then the social worker in particular will be the person who goes through the list of people to find the, that pers a person to make decisions for you. So under the hierarchy, um, it starts with spouse and adult children, and then they go down the list. However, this is not always the person who is looking after them at home. If they want you to speak for them, strongly consider a representation agreement. So I often find that um, one adult child is looking after uh, their parent, but the person who um, has decided they will be the decision maker is not living with that with the parent um, so families have divided roles up you know I'm gonna work with I'm gonna take care of mom or dad but if decisions need, need to be made then it should be you who makes the decisions and when that kind of thing starts to happen it gets really really mucky for the healthcare care um, teams so this is the list of temporary substitute decision makers that the hospital will look at and it can get very messy. The spouse, and what if the spouse is also going down their, the same dementia road as their loved one and they can't remember everything that's going on or they're overwhelmed or they're scared. The hospital's staff will still continue to look to that spouse to be the number one person on their list. And I've seen where they will not talk to the adult children because the spouse is able to take that information. The adult children are all um, equally uh, ranked. So if there are two or three or four or five children, adult children, they are expected to make decisions together. They can assign um, a person to be the spokesperson, but that can get messy. Um, parents are equally ranked. Siblings are equally ranked and so on down the list. So you can imagine that if there are if there are parents for an adult um, uh, patient and those parents are divorced or separated are, are not speaking well to try and have um, a clear conversation about what will happen with the health care with their of their adult child can be very problematic all of this is often why um, the ethics committee of a hospital are involved. So wherever possible, try and lighten the load for your family, try and lighten the load for your healthcare team by naming a representative. In British Columbia, a substitute decision maker is formally and legally named on a representation agreement. We are the only province in Canada that has a representation agreement other, in other provinces, they are uh, named on the advanced directive or the document that is similar to an advanced directive. Um, the piece that I want to point out uh, about representation agreements is that if memory issues are becoming apparent, it is imperative to make decisions regarding representation and enduring power of attorney document, documentation as soon as possible. Things don't get better with dementia, they only get worse. We look for a moment in time where we can have these conversations. Um, often the person with dementia is um, starts to become very um, uh, secretive 
about their their memory issues they get very um uh they double down or maybe a little bit paranoid uh i see a lot of paranoia with a pa patients who have dementia as it progresses and then they don't want to name anybody so it's really really vital that the earlier the conversations take place with somebody with dementia and have somebody assigned as their representative, the better. A few things to consider when choosing a representative. You can't be paid to care for them unless you're a spouse or an adult child. So um, usually this is set up by a lawyer so that uh, an adult child or a spouse can be paid um, to take time off of work to care for the adult but they're trying to avoid any issues of uh, paid caregiver, caregivers coming in and um, maybe not caring for the person the way that they should. Uh, this is especially relevant for money, maybe not so much for care. They must be a mentally capable adult. They must be readily available, even by phone. And this has been a huge good shift during the COVID uh, crisis is that doctors are now getting paid to have consultations by phone. And so they're much more, um, they'd be much more reliable about making phone calls to uh, loved ones. And it doesn't really matter where they are in the world. It, legally, it doesn't matter. Uh, financially, it does. They can't be across any international border, but representative could be in Los Angeles, or New York or in Europe, as long as they can be reached by phone and time, the time changes are not a big issue. If you are readily and willing to take on the role. So this is where spouses are often not the best person. They are exhausted, they are overwhelmed, um, they might be scared, they don't wanna take on the big issues, but also, Adult daughters and daughters-in-laws are 80% of the time are picked as representatives, but are they the best person? Can they take time away from their own families? Um, and so you can pick somebody like a neighbor or a friend if all of the people you would normally pick are unavailable, too far away, or are not able to take on the role. They will take they will respect your religious and spiritual beliefs and this is really important especially if somebody has requested medical assistance in dying um, and the the person they pick does not believe in it that can be a really um, big issue so i'm just pointing that as, out as an example and they will carry out your wishes even if they are different from your own so the closer the family member is the more they don't believe in what you believe the more friction um, that can cause. You might want to pick somebody a little bit more neutral who will get um, give you the care that you want to receive. The representative is often a close relative, but they can also be a close neighbor or friend. So I had a client named um, Matthew, and he was uh, he had never been married. He was 86 years old. He knew that he needed to go into long-term care. He was having a lot of health issues. Both his niece and his nephew lived quite a ways away, but his next door neighbor, Mary, had been close to him for years. So he picked Mary as his representative, and then she was in close contact with the niece and the nephew, and they made decisions together. But ulti ultimately, Mary had the final say if decisions about his housing and home care needed to be made. And then it's important to talk with your representative and loved ones. Share your values, beliefs, and preferences for future health care. And don't make the assumption that they, they will know what you want. So who can prepare a representation agreement? A lawyer is not required, but considering, consider le seeking legal counsel for any complex situations. Um, so if you, the, nidus.ca which i've put down here have as far as i'm concerned the easiest most easily understood representation agreements available and you can do it for free there they allow 
one person to be the representative and another person as the alternate if the representative isn't there. Sometimes there is the need to have two people to make decisions, um, such as a wife and a daughter, and they can make decisions by themselves or um, together if the other person, you know, by themselves if the other person is, isn't available. So you need to go to a lawyer for something complex like that. The NIDAS agreement doesn't um, have the ability to have anything complex. It doesn't have the ability for any um, additional instructions for your representatives that you might want to have in your representation agreement. There are forms on the Government of BC website. I have found them to be um, difficult to navigate. They are not clear. They keep on saying that they're going to change them, but I haven't seen that yet. There are also forms on the guard, public guardian and trustee website. So for a fee, lawyers specialized in elder law or estate law, please make sure that you go to a lawyer who's got a lot of experience regarding elder law or estate law. Um, you don't want a tax lawyer doing this. Um, ironically, real estate lawyers and estate lawyers um, they both often have both specialties. <clears throat> if you're going to go to a lawyer to draw, draw up your documents, they often put all the advanced care planning documents, such as the representation agreement, the enduring power of attorney, and possibly your advanced directive in one document. I ask that you ask to have them all separated into separate documents. This is especially important for the representation agreement and the advanced directive, because in a, high, in a time of healthcare crisis, physicians will not take the time to read through a 20 page document to find out who should be speaking for you. And you need to be able to update the document as your health and circumstances change. So if one of your represent, representatives moves or it becomes ill themselves or dies, to go to the lawyer and have the entire document changed um, is more financially onerous than just being, being able to have one of the documents changed. So there are two types of representation agreements, and this is especially important for this group. A representation agreement seven um, may be signed by someone who does not meet the traditional definition of capability. So even if somebody has lost the ability to manage their own day-to-day -day -day affairs and to be able to um, uh, even take care of themselves, as long as they can name the person who they want to care for them or make their decisions, they can just say, yes, Mary, and they can even sign with as much as an X. That person can look after the financial portion if an enduring power of attorney has not been put in place. And um, it's, a, it's a great document for people who have lost some ability to manage their own affairs. So somebody with progressing dementia, somebody with physical disabilities, such as a recent stroke, um, where they can't say anymore who it was, but they can direct who they want. Um, is really important. But this person that they name has limited ability, uh, somewhat limited ability. They cannot make uh, big financial decisions. They can't open and close bank accounts or investments, and they can't make end of life decisions, such as taking somebody off a ventilator. And they also can't do, um, they can't help place in a residential care facility. And that is recent leg legislation. So if, I always recommend wherever possible um, to do your representation agreement early. It never expires. And it's the most appropriate document for most adults. It does not allow for financial management. So an enduring power of attorney should be considered if you wish to appoint somebody to ma manage your financial affairs. A representation agreement nine, so we call it an RA nine, is authorized to assist you with health care to help you make your healthcare decisions, including end-of-life decisions, or speak on your behalf when you are unable. It also allows for personal care to collect your mail, water your plants, clean out your fridge. They can make decisions about 
future living arrangements such as assisted living or long-term care. So there are several documents that um, you need separate documents, but one person could do all of the things uh, that you need done, or you can separate these to people who are most uh, capable or able. So an enduring power of attorney, when both of my mom and dad were um, dying, my brother became the enduring power, of, was the enduring power of attorney for both of them. He was much better with a spreadsheet and with a checkbook than I, than I am, but I became the representative. So I was represent, health representative for both my parents. Both of us had, a, had jobs. We were both very busy with the work that the, we were doing. Each of us had our own form. A lot of people think that an enduring power of attorney gives them the right to speak on somebody's behalf in the hospital. It does not. If the, um, a lot of people in the healthcare industry do not understand that, so people wave around an enduring power of attorney form and, they, and the healthcare team just accepts it. But legally, that's just plain not correct. And I just want to underline that with great big, huge red letters and an exclamation mark. If you want somebody to speak on your behalf for your health care, you must have a representation agreement. The other person who you, can, you need to name is your executor for your will. And then some people might need a guardian and or trustee if they don't have somebody to speak for them. So these are the various documents in advance um, care planning and one person can do all the jobs or you can split them up, but they must have separate forms. Finally, talking with your substitute decision makers and loved ones. You've gotten all the forms in place. Um, it's really important that you now talk to the people that you love about what you want all the time I see representation agreements who and I'll say who's your representative and they'll say my son Michael does Michael know what a representation agreement is um, I'm not sure he does and so I talk to Michael and I say you're your mom's representative do you know what that means I'm her representative so not only does he not know that he's the representative or what it means he doesn't hasn't had the conversation with his mom about what her values and beliefs are. And without having that discussion, a representation agreement is virtually useless. Conversations with your loved ones and substitute decision makers are the most valuable and important piece of advanced care planning. So if there's only one thing that you take away from today is to have these conversations with your loved ones, what would you want to have happen if you were seriously ill and you could not speak for yourself. Would you want to have life-saving measures? What, would, what ceremonies would you like? What's important to you in your last days or weeks? Um, what foods would you like? What ceremonies would you want done? Those are really, really important conversations. These conversations aren't easy. Try to keep, to keep it simple, direct, and specific. So before I go on to ongoing conversations, I, the earlier you have those conversations, the less um, power that they have, the less intensity, and you can say to the person, there's nothing wrong with me now, or, you know, I'm really quite healthy considering all that's going on in, with my health. I just want to start talking about and Often we make in our heads that it's much more um, that these conversations are going to be much worse than they were. So when I sat down with my daughter, who is my primary representative, um, to talk to her about what would happen to me if I was hit by the proverbial bus or if I'd had a massive stroke. Um, and I talked to her about, yes, I want resuscitation done at this point in my life, but I don't want to go to long-term care if I'm going to have to be in long-term care for the rest of my life. I would rather an infection take its course with me. I don't want to be a vegetable. And I use that word, I'm sorry, pejoratively, but that's one that we all kind of understand. Um, and it actually was not that difficult a conversation. I've helped, had 
helped other people write out their values and beliefs and what they want for their future care. And they've written it out as a letter and then had their families over and just um, with me there to try and lower the, um, the temperature in the room, so to speak. And they just read out the letter to their loved ones so that they're not interrupted and they stay in logic until after that is done. And that's been a huge piece. Then once you've done that, ongoing conversations are not so tough. Uh, and they can lead to deeper conversations over time. If it's just too tough to think of what to say, write that heartfelt letter or start with statements that will ease their minds a bit. I read an article last week from a doctor saying that everyone should be having discussions about this, especially during a time of COVID. It may be the greatest gift you can give to those you love. If you don't, if you want to reduce the amount of complex grieving that they are going to experience after your death, then it's really important that you have these conversations now. And then document your preferences for care. So advanced directives, and I've got about 15 minutes, so to speak, and this can be a, uh, a pretty um, in-depth, very short conversation. So I just want you to take a deep breath. If you've got a glass of water, I want you to take a sip. And then here we go. Every province has a different name and healthcare legislation stating your values, beliefs, and preferences for future care. The universally recognized name um, is advanced directive. In BC, it is luckily called an advanced directive. Across the country, there are about mm, nine different names for what this uh, directive is called. It can be a personal directive, it can be a health directive, it can be a personal care directive. Um, but in BC, it is an advanced directive. When documents are called something else, such as a living will, a basic advanced care plan, a personal directive, these are basically wishes that you want to have that doctors and nurses will take into consideration at the end of your lives. But it is not a legal document. They are not forced to. Um, abide by these. So if you want to have something like my client had, which was the three sentences, if I cannot leave this hospital, if I can't be in my garden, if I can't hold my grandchildren on my lap, that is considered um, a basic advanced care plan or a personal directive. You can just sign it, you can date it and sign it, and it will be taken into consideration. So if you want it to just kind of talk about your values and beliefs, that's really important. If that's all you get done, then please do that part. But if it is signed, dated, and witnessed by two people, it is a legally enforceable document. During this pandemic, if you have not identified a substitute decision maker, or they may not be immediately available to speak to a healthcare professional, your advanced directive should be as clear and detailed as possible. And I'm going to get into what you might write on that. Your healthcare clinicians need to know who is going to speak for you if you can no longer, if you no longer have the capacity to speak for yourself. Specific medical treatments you do not want, such as CPR, intubation, and ventilation, your values and beliefs, and that it is signed, witnessed, and date, dated. So why would you need to write in your values and beliefs? if you had said that you did not want CPR. So I had a 62 year old woman come to me wanting an advanced directive written and she did not want CPR. Number one, you need to have a medical order signed for no CPR if you, in British Columbia, you can't just write it on your advanced directive. Um, but she didn't want CPR, she was 62 years old. She looked healthy, she was, articulate, she could speak for herself, but she had a lot of underlying health conditions that were not readily apparent. And she wanted to write down, I have and her health conditions, and I don't want to live in long-term care. I don't want anybody to look after me. 
uh, if I'm not capable of looking after myself, then I, I don't want to live. She needed to put her values and beliefs because as a 62 year old, the healthcare system would go, well, of course, we're going to do absolutely everything for you. You're only 62 years old. When she put all the other information with it, it was more likely that they would take that into consideration. So representative discussions and decisions take precedence over advanced directives. I'm going to break that down. So in your advanced directive, you, let's, let's say Susan is um, a name I've just made up, and Susan is, um, had, has, advanced, uh, demen had, has advanced dementia. Uh, she's in long-term care, and she only has stated previously that she only wants symptom management and comfort care. Um, but then she has a urinary tract infection, which is causing her to have delirium. Um, she's not enjoying, you know, she she's basically been enjoying her life, but the urinary tract infection is really taking some of the punch out of her life. Um, and the representative can then say, this is not what mom wanted, she would have wanted. She would have wanted something as simple as a urinary tract infection treated, and please give her antibiotics. Or it's very common for somebody to say that they don't want any heroics done, they don't want any advanced medical care, and then they, um, they need a blood transfusion, which will give them a much higher quality of life. It allows the representatives to say, yes, I'm overriding that decision, and yes, please give her um, blood transfusion. Because we're all lay people, and we, cannot, um, we do not know what's going to happen to us. We don't have a crystal ball. The representation agreement allows that person to make decisions in the time with more information given to them. You might not want to die over the Christmas season, so you might want extra um, an extra round of antibiotics or a, a fluid bolus so that you um, don't die over the Christmas uh, season and or a birthday or maybe you want to hold your grandchild one more time. The represent, your representative can then say, can we just give mom just a little bit more care so that she or treatment so that she can hold that first grandchild. So that's why representation agreements take precedence over advanced directives. But if you want your advanced directive recognized and abided by no matter what, you need to have that written in your in your representation agreement and it needs to be done by a lawyer. But rep representatives are legally obligated to honor your wishes or what they believe you would want if you had been able to speak for yourself. So it's not what they want in their own decisions for you but what they want for themselves so who can write an advanced directive you can if it meets the legal requirements and proper it is properly witnessed it is valid strongly consider um, discussing the most appropriate level of care with your physicians or nurse practitioner before you write your advanced advanced directive so what i have done is i have based an advanced directive uh, template based on where you are in your healthcare journey. Um, and I have based that on the medical orders for scope of treatment. Providence Health calls this options for care. Across the country, they are generally known as goals of care. Um, a note about advanced care planning orders. They are orders signed by a doctor or a nurse practitioner, practitioner usually in hospital, after consulting with your substitute decision maker about the level of resuscitation that you want. Discussions and decisions for your advanced directive are made prior to a crisis, like now, but medical orders are usually written during a hospitalization or crisis, and your advanced directive and medical orders should work hand in hand. So if you take your advanced directive into the hospital and it says that you do not want to be resuscitated, that you do not want to be put on a ventilator, those should be transferred into medical orders to say the same thing. So 
So writing your advanced directive, think about the level of care you would want to receive. And when you break it down into these five options, it's easier to make decisions that are appropriate for where you are in your healthcare journey. We've, um, I've made it from most intensive to least intensive. The focus at each level is where you are in your health journey and on your values and beliefs. Use this as a guide when you talk to your loved ones and representatives and writing your advanced directive. So level five is the highest level of care. Perform all resuscitation, including CPR. This is where I have put myself right now. Um, I'm in my mid sixties, but um, I still feel like I could, re I have no other underlying conditions. So I would probably survive CPR if somebody was able to start it soon enough, but I would want my health to be reevaluated within a couple of days and see, based on my values and beliefs, whether they should continue to treat me or take me off of life support. Cardiopulmonary resuscitation includes chest compressions, intubation, ventilation, and defibrillation. If your heart is restarted, you will go to ICU and you will likely be on a ventilator. So I've seen advanced directives where people say, only start CPR if it looks like I will make a full recovery. That is absolutely impossible to say. So um, it's more important that you say, do CPR, but in a couple of days, take a really good review of um, my situation and decide where to go from there. And all of that is in my book um, with a lot more detail. If you do not want to be resuscitated uh, at home or in the community, you must have a no CPR form signed by you and your doctor and have that form with you or have a medical alert bracelet on you. So if you go down in the frozen pee aisle of Safeway and you do not have your do not resuscitate or your no CPR form, it's called in British Columbia, it's called a no CPR form. If you don't have that with you, you don't have a medical alert bracelet on paramedics are obligated to start CPR. This level is for those who are relatively healthy and want full resuscitation. Everything will be done to save your life. A little bit down from that is do not perform CPR, but allow other forms of resuscitation and transfer to critical care. So this is often the level if you're getting older, if you've got other underlying healthcare conditions and say you came down with COVID that you probably would want to be in this category. So they're doing absolutely everything for you except cardiopulmonary resuscitation. This is for those who want the option of admission to ICU or critical care unit and want all medical care, including being on a ventilator, but do not want CPR. You may still want or need extra vigilance and care after a serious injury, illness, or surgery. And you can choose this level of care, but you can also stipulate treatments you don't want done, such as ventilator or dialysis or tube feeding. So when somebody says that they do not want life support, that was the level that they meant. Uh, the use of a ventilator is considered life support. So this is where most adults with some complex illness um, who do not want to be resuscitated will lie. Medical transfer without transfer to critical care. Do not perform CPR, chest compressions, or any resuscitation. Symptom management and may involve transport to hospital for a higher level of care. So if you've got complex health conditions and you do not want heroics, this is likely the level that you will be at. It even applies for people who are in long-term care or residential care who might need to be transferred to hospital for such things as a hip repair or to have blood transfusions or to have IV antibiotics. This is the place that gives you a lot more flexibility. If you say that you do not wanna be transported to hospital or to a higher, higher level of care, you're just not gonna get some of the things that you might need. It's meant for those who have significant health issues or frailty. 
Because of this is conservative treatment, it does not include the use of a ventilator, but can include the option for non-invasive respiratory support, such as CPAP or BiPAP. You might be hearing about that or seeing that more often because of COVID. They're trying not to put people on ventilators. They found that it was doing more damage than it was doing good and they have found ways so that the virus doesn't spray around the room um, and so they're using a lot of CPAP and BiPAP. It's just a tube into your mouth, not deeply down your throat and um, it just gives you a lot more oxygen and a lot and some pressure to be able to push the oxygen into your lungs. The level two is for those who are approaching or at end of life. Do not perform CPR or any resuscitation symptom management and supportive care only. This is for those who have multiple health care issues or frailty who are nearing the end of life. It's often the most appropriate for those in residential care or receiving palliative care who are nearing the end of life. The goal is conservative management of medical conditions with specific short-term directed treatment. It may allow medications such as oral antibiotics to be given. So unless you are in hospice, this or, or um, you are absolutely at the end of your life, this is the most likely um, level that you should be at. And then finally is end of life. Do not perform CPR or resuscitation, symptom management only. This is for those who are at the natural end of the life who have a life-limiting disease or no longer want treatment, but want to maximize comfort and symptom control at the end of their lives. So you can see from all of that that you would not want to have one advanced directive in place on your representation agreement because it's meant to be changed over time. And sometimes as your, your disease is progressing quickly, you may want your advanced directive to, to change quickly as well. So here's a checklist for a completed advanced care plan. You've chosen your future substitute decision makers and wherever possible, uh, had a representation agreement drawn up, thought about your values and beliefs, decided on your preferences for future health care, especially do you want CPR or to be in ICU, discussed your values, beliefs, and preferences for future health care, and completed your advanced directive, had it signed and witnessed, completed or re reviewed your power of attorney for finance and indicate where it can be found, and complete your will and indicate where it can be found. Put copies, and I really think you should put copies of all these forms on, on your fridge. Don't put the originals here. Put a note where the originals can be found. You don't want these forms to become a part of your chart, and you, it will be really difficult to get them back. Put copies of relevant documents in a clear folder, binder. In Fraser Health, there's a green sleeve, and place these documents on or beside your fridge or put a clear note on your fridge indicating where the documents can be found. Give copies of important documents to your substitute decision makers, your enduring power of attorney, and your executor, and let them know what the forms are for. And just a quick note that if your directive is specifically in preparation for COVID-19 and it is different than it would be at other times, consider revoking and rewriting your directive after this crisis has passed and a few more additional notes. I, my team and I developed a very comprehensive in case of emergency form that has all of that information that we've talked about on one form. It is uh, printable, downloadable, fillable online, and it's for free. And uh, the form can be found on patientpathways.ca under um, plan ahead. And a few additional things to think about. Do you have someone else in your home that will need care? Clean, clearly indicate that and who the first responders should call. Make pre-arrangements for your pets and have those clearly indicated on your document. And please let somebody know where all relevant account and computer passwords are. It can be one of the most frustrating things in estate planning when somebody doesn't can't find those passwords. Leave a legacy and not a mess. It's an opportunity for you to review your financial um, preparation and estate planning. 
financial planners and notaries are all working. They've never worked so hard. Most of them are working from home, but they are working. And it's a time for questions. I must have overwhelmed everybody. Oh, somebody's typing yay. <laughs> So please remember to go down into the chat box and type your questions in there. And while the